Well, that's what happens when you live in quadrant one. It's the burnout problem. Because you never get to the end of the important work. And the urgency wears you down. And it's not just one thing being urgent, it's multiple things being urgent. And there are only so many hours in the day. And then you get tired and you can't catch up on sleep. And you can't catch up on your own wellness. You live in quadrant one. It's the burnout quadrant. When people who are not in quadrant one in this, in this work here, where are they? They're in quadrant three. They're doing things that are not important to them, but they're urgent for somebody else. Ring a bell? Mm -hmm. um, and think how quadrant three has expanded since we all carry with us quadrant three machines. <laughs> you recognize what I'm saying, right? This machine means that anybody who we've ever met, who ever wants to meet me, or somebody who just wants my money or my vote, can contact me. Is it urgent? Well, there it is. Now, I'm at fault by thinking that any little beep is urgent, right? Mm -hmm. have, have you all met anybody with the discipline to uh, like only use this an hour a day? It's not just discipline, though. It, it brings dopamine now in your brain. You get addicted to it. There we go. No, okay, I don't feel so bad now. <laughs> but we are, we are all addicted to this constantly checking. And in some ways, to use this, it's as if here comes an urgent buzz in my pocket. And I go, hey, maybe it's important. <laughs> hmm, no, it's not, <laughs> it's not important. So this is, the, this is the frustrating quadrant. So if you go back and forth between the burnout quadrant and the frustrating quadrant, inevitably, you uh, retreat to quadrant four, which is it's not important and it's not urgent. And you, can, you probably have your own mental image of that. You know, mine involves a, a lounge chair and a cable television network with, it, with at least 100 stations and that bottle of bourbon I mentioned earlier. <laughs> and at some point I look at the bottle of bourbon and go, where did that go? <laughs> That's quadrant four. And you can't stay in quadrant four too long because you lose your uh, job. Or your, <laughs> you lose your job or your, uh, your spouse, your partner in life, um, your self-respect. So you can't live in quadrant four. Now, you, you see the quadrant we haven't talked about, right? And th this is Covey's whole point, which is that <clears throat> quadrant two, when you're doing important matters in a non-urgent way, has a whole different quality to it. Now, I have to say that Ann, A-N-N, has built in a quadrant two opportunity for you this afternoon. Here you are. Everything, nothing we're doing right now has, is urgent. Like your light, your, 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 well, it's not urgent. <laughs> it's not urgent. But I hope it's important. I'm trying as hard as I can to have us talk about important matters here. And, um, you realize you're going to pay for it. At 4.30, you'll have like 100 emails, right? That, that's if, you, if you're not working it under the table right now. I mean, you're all, I have to say, I'm very impressed. Usually there are a couple of people who are, you know, and, and, and not only important messages, but the dopamine is in. They're saying, well, there's a game on, or, or let me see what the latest poll in South Carolina is. You, can, you just are, you get addicted to the connect, connectedness. Well. Quadrant two time for organizations is what I call mission time. And the, the central chapter of my book, chapter four, is called mission time. And I think it's the sine qua non. It's the without which none of the rest works. You can have the best assumptions in the world about, us, about feedback and about assessment and about systems. And if you don't have time to create them with your colleagues, if you don't have time to educate yourselves and others about what you need to do, you might as well not bother. So the creation, the protection of mission time, for me, is the single biggest job of a leader of an organization. It's to not give in to the tyranny of quadrant one. Now, one of the things that Covey said all those years ago was that if you actually create quadrant two time, you end up saving time in quadrant one. And if you think about it as an organization, mission time, that's retreat time. It's the kind of time when you're sitting with your colleagues and saying, what are we trying to do? What do we do and what do we not do? 
just imagine answering the question, what do we not do? And then you go back into your urgent world where somebody comes to you and goes, hey, will you do this? That time in quadrant two just made you able to say, no, actually, we just had a meeting about this. We don't do that. Instead, if you haven't done that, you go, well, maybe. Is there any money in it? <laughs> right? So you start chasing dollars for things that you know you don't do or that are off your mission and the like. So the creation and protection of mission time is the third uh, shift. It's from burning out in quadrant one to chilling out in quadrant two. It's the practice of mission time. There's almost no single difference you could make in your organizations uh, that would be bigger and longer term because what you do in mission time is the work of formative assessment. What are we trying to do? How would we know it if we saw it? How could we set up feedback so we get feedback along the way? From whom? How about how do we get it from people we don't bump into every day? So I'm um, suggesting that the kind of conversation, the formative assessment conversation, needs a format, and that this tool of the rubric is a great choice. It's a great choice because it's entirely yours. It's not a funder saying, here's your rubric. It's yourself saying, what do we care about? What are the criteria for success? What do we want to plan backwards from at a, not only a good level, but a really good level, an aspirational level, a high level. I was hearing the whole last half hour of your meeting this morning, I was picturing an Anne rubric. You were talking about that, you used the example of mentoring a new ED. Well, what if instead of one of you saying, well, you know, I mentored a new ED and not and then others going, good, that's good, hope that's great. What if you had a rubric where you got to say together, well, what did the mentoring look like? What did you talk about? What did you talk about in terms of managing a board? What did you talk about in terms of uh, communications, internal and external? In other words, there's a curriculum implicit in the whole concept of mentoring. But if you just say, hey, that's cool, you mentored, you haven't used formative assessment. You haven't taken the opportunity to say, if this is important enough um, that, that we could unpack it a little bit, uh, we could all up our game. Well, you can't up your game unless you have mission time together. The, um, you know, this, this uh, having a network to begin with, for me, represents a yearning for mission time together. Yet, <coughs> most networks don't provide enough of it. And that everybody's gung-ho and they say, well, we will have a listserv or we'll, we'll have some way to communicate. And then they're so deep into quadrant one that they dip in occasionally. It doesn't change their work. It doesn't change their, their level of, of performance. So, um, so I'm going to make the case to you that this simple tool could change your life. Because it, by definition, is important conversations. Why? Because you're the one filling in what, the, what it's about. And since you can hardly ever get to the end of a complicated conversation, let me go back to the one that doesn't have something in it. Since you can't get to the end of this, the rubric literally holds, holds, as in contains, your conversation until you can come back to it. Picture coming back in mission time and saying, now where were we? Oh, here we were. The rubric actually literally shows you where you left off. And you write draft at the top. You write draft and the date, and then you come back, and then you write another draft. It literally holds your best thinking up to that time. And there's an assumption that our best thinking is constantly evolving and growing. And the more people in on it, the better. The more we demystify what good work looks like, the more we bring more people into owning what good work looks like, that's a formative assessment system. That's a feedback system where you're saying, where's my feedback? Not, how do I get out of this? I just want to show you, uh, we're going to take a break in a second. When did we start? Yeah, yeah we'll take a break in, in just a, in a few, few minutes. I want to, um, I want to show you how I, how I uh, train rubric writers. You know, sometimes I'll do a, like a whole day on people who are saying, yeah, yeah, uh, we, we're with it. We want to, we want to use rubrics. And uh, so I, I, I come up with a way to train people that I think is really good. Now, I will say, and this, this isn't quite as bald-faced, I'm not trying to sell so much as tell you that I've not, 
three chapters worth of examples of rubrics in the book. I, before I had the book, I used to have to try to tell, say everything I ever thought of about rubrics and give a million examples and race a mile a minute in presentations like this. Now I, I know I can go, well, you know, if you really, if you like it, if you want to see, there are all these interesting rubrics that organizations of large and small, old and new, uh, specific nationwide projects have, have used the rubric uh, form. Well, the way I train people is to say, imagine them that, that whatever they've done up to this point, they chuck it and say, I'm going to open a restaurant. And that they're going to create a training rubric for their waiters. So they actually want to say, how do I use formative assessment to help my waiters be as great as I want them to be? Well, the first thing you do, I mean, first of all, you need to know what, what's worth the rubric. So, because you can't write a rubric on everything. Some people get tempted, but you, you can't do it. So let's imagine this matters enough. Then the first thing you do with any rubric is you actually brainstorm traits and criteria. So if we were doing this, we, we, you know, we, we'd take a long time. We're not going to take a long time. But just let me just walk you through it quickly, is that brainstorming traits, imagine adjectives. Just tell me anything that you think of where you go, this is a trait I would like my waiter to have. I want them to be courteous, courteous accurate. accurate. Cool. Patient. And keep going. Friendly. Now, at this stage, good, 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 good. Thank you, thank you. Now, this is what what you're doing is literally brainstorming. And and when you get good at rubric writing, you never censor yourself at this point. You just you just let it all out. You just make a list. You list 20 traits or criteria, and you don't go, hmm, do I really mean that? No, that comes later. We can prioritize later. You have to stick with it long enough to come up with the thing that wasn't right at the front of your mind. You push it a little bit, and you think back about waiters that you